All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Tuliomi's August Nature and You Lecture. My name is Jeff Ben. I'm the Education Associate at Tuliomi. Um, if you don't know, Tuliomi is a conservation nonprofit located in Woodland. Our mission is protecting public access to public lands and educating the public about those uh, public lands. And we like to focus on the northern inner coast range area, which are the uh, mountains that are to the west of Davis and Woodland, uh, particularly the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, which is uh, a relatively new national monument that stretches all the way from the kind of southeast corner of Lake Berryessa all the way up to the Snow Mountain and uh, Yuki Wilderness areas up in uh, the Mendocino National Forest. Um, we do lots of different programs, including this monthly lecture series, uh, K-12 field trips, public hikes and trail building days. So if you're interested in uh, learning more about any of those programs or joining us, um, you can uh, go to our website at tuliomi.org. We are also um, involved in a project to expand Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument um, by adding a region called uh, Moloch Loyak, um, which is already part of public lands, but we want to give it uh, some additional protection uh, due to its biological and cultural significance. Um, that's a ridge line that runs uh, kind of along the border of Calusa and Lake Counties. So if you're interested in learning more about that effort or supporting it, um, you can do that through our website as well. All right, so without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Brianna Martinico is a PhD candidate in ecology at UC Davis. She is also a wildlife biologist with UC Cooperative Extension, and she'll be talking to us tonight about um, the benefits that can come from wild birds in California agriculture. Um, and so during the talk, um, we'll hold questions until the end, and then we can send in questions either through the chat um, or uh, you can raise your hand and ask questions. Um, during the talk, please be sure to have your uh, microphone muted. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Brianna. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about birds and agriculture. It is a passion of mine. And um, I'm also working kind of in the same area that Jeff was talking about. So I worked on some of my PhD research in Yolo County. And currently um, in my UC a &R position, I'm working in Napa Lake and Solano County. So um, there are a lot of different types of agriculture there. And so lots of different benefits. I'm definitely not going to cover everything. So um, if you do have questions about anything that I didn't cover, I would be happy to talk about that at the end as well. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that the um, earth surface is covered and dominated actually by agriculture. Over 40% of our um, land use is agriculture. And um, on top of that, we're also seeing global species declines. And um, a recent study in 2019 estimated that in North America alone, we might be have lost over 3 billion birds just in the past 50 years. And so a traditional way to approach conservation, especially for birds or other um, wildlife species, is creating reserves. And um, the thing about reserves is that you could think of those as little postage stamps across the um, landscape. We're not able to really have everywhere protected. And so um, being creative and taking a diff additional approaches such as conservation in working landscapes, creating landscapes that basically work for people and for wildlife um, can be beneficial. And so um, we, can call that multiple um, benefit. We can, you know, call that there's multiple benefits of conservation in agriculture. So one of those benefits is increasing the amount of available habitat to birds and other wildlife, um, allowing for connectivity for when birds are moving through for migration or dispersal or just rain shifts over time, um, as climate change um, is impacting different regions of the globe, species are going to need to move. Um, and this and having these areas compatible with wildlife can help enable that. 
Um, and then it benefits people because we can increase ecosystem services and sustainability of agriculture um, by inviting wildlife to share these spaces with us. Um, and so biodiversity persists in California agriculture. Um, we there, like I was saying, there's a lot of different types of agricultural landscapes, um, some that have just these remnant patches of habitat, others that um, where that are dominated by natural habitat with um, fields that are interspersed. But um, throughout these landscapes, um, we're seeing things like, um, you know, abundant uh, so abundant and diverse wintering raptor populations. And we can really brag about this, that we have one of the most um, diverse rap winter raptoring populations. And I use this as an example because I love raptors. So uh, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today will be, will be about raptors. But, um, you know, over 15 species migrate to the Central Valley and use these agricultural fields as critical habitat to sustain themselves over the winter. Um, and in the summer, you may have seen scenes like this where um, flooded alfalfa fields invite in um, hundreds of Swainson's hawks, herons, and egrets, and other um, predatory birds and mammals. And they're all going after these guys here, these um, gophers that are getting disturbed and, and fleeing. And so we call this a, a raptor buffet because it's really just kind of uh, a buffet for them. And, and um, so if you do live in the Central Valley, keep your eye out in the summer for these large, these large um, aggregations. Um, but some birds, they can also damage crops, you know, um, these, this is a picture of thousands of snow geese in a pasture. They're consuming the same resources that these um, producers um, were intending to be for um, their grazing cattle. And so sometimes we can get into conflicts with wildlife and um, that's where I really want to introduce this term, the net benefits of birds in agriculture. So that's taking into account the sum of the total good that they're providing and the um, possible negative aspects of as well. And overall, a lot of research is showing that, you know, there are positive net benefits of having birds and other wildlife in agriculture. Um, so this is just a diagram um, we were working on um, looking at birds in sunflowers and um, we were investigating whether or not how or whether or not habitat on the edges of fields or nearby in the um, local landscape, whether um, that supported beneficial birds or pest birds. Um, so when a bird provides um, an ecosystem service, we would call it a beneficial bird. So some types of ecosystem services are insect pest control, you know, um, but the disservices would be if those birds became pests and started foraging on the crops. And um, this can actually be dependent on what's going on at the local scale. So how um, is that field managed? What is the crop? What is the surrounding habitat? And then also, sorry, and then also kind of where are, where is this field on the globe? You know, what is that background community of birds that are already going to be present in those areas. And so th those are some of the things that we take into account when looking at the role of birds on farms. Um, on top of location um, and scale, we also have to take into account seasonality because um, some species can be beneficial in the spring, but could become significant pests in the fall. So for example, um, these blackbirds in spring are collecting these insects from the leaves of these sunflowers. Um, but in fall, they are actually going to be consuming uh, these sunflower seeds. Sorry, just one second. Um, but so, Things like diet changes, um, flocking and ter territoriality, and whether or not a species is migratory are all things that um, 
could shift uh, seasonally and how they are pests are beneficial in our um, agricultural systems. So um, I'm going to focus the uh, a good portion of my talk on how we promote and manage for beneficial birds in agriculture. And so two groups of that are um, our raptors and our songbirds. So raptors are going to be providing rodent pest control and songbird songbirds are going to be um, consuming a lot of insects, especially pest insects. And so um, helping people invite these um, species into their um, ranches and their fields is, you know, a way to promote ecosystem services from these species. So up first are our raptors. Um, these are three of our most common raptors that are found here um, in California that play a role in vertebrate pest control on farms. So up first, we have our smallest falcon, the American kestrel. Um, they are, they are, yeah, don't let their size fool you. Um, they're very fierce. They can eat birds that are nearly their size. Um, so up to, you know, the size of like a meadow lark or a blackbird. Um, they also eat voles um, and they focus on insects like crickets and grasshoppers and, and other things as well. Um, in the center here, we have barn owls. They're really gopher vole specialists, which um, are a problem across the region, especially, and for a variety of crops, especially though in perennial crops, because they will chew roots and girdle tree trunks and vines. Um, the, the rodents will. <laughs> um, and then here we have a red tail hawk, which I'm highlighting because um, you can find those here year round. They um, red-tailed hawks breed in and around our agricultural fields in our neighborhoods. Um, and we also have a substantial wintering population that comes in from the north. So you'll actually see their numbers grow in winter. Um, so three ways that you can um, promote raptors in agriculture are um, using nest boxes, trees, um, and raptor perches. Um, and um, so I, when I'm talking about raptors in general, it's just a, a generic term for all hawks, owls, falcons, eagles, harriers, and kites. And, and like I said, we have a really um, diverse and abundant um, host of these species around us. But why I like to share this slide is because all of these um, raptors, for the most part, will eat voles, gophers, mice, and rats in some portion of their diet. Um, some of the larger species, eagles and other larger hawks, will also eat ground squirrels and rabbits, which ground squirrels um, can be very pesky. Um, but raptors aren't only um, influencing their prey by consuming them directly. Um, the presence of a predator is also across many taxa, across all different animals, even bugs, which I found out, they all can sense when their predators are nearby and shift their behavior. And so when a pest species um, shifts their behavior, when a predator is present, they could be um, causing, the result is that they end up causing less damage because they um, are moving around less, they're foraging less, they're reproducing rest less, and they're just not able to cause as much damage. So we can get benefits just through the presence of predators. Um, some other research has shown that um, the use of um, promoting raptors in um, agricultural areas is more cost effective than purchasing and applying rodenticides. So rodenticides are um, basically pesticides that um, rodents consume, um, which is lethal. And those can travel through the food chain to raptors, to other top predators and other species and have damaging effects. So um, a good thing is that there's a huge shift for people to move away from these things. And so one benefit um, of raptors is that um, it can kind of, by promoting raptors, you can kind of start to facilitate the shift away from these more damaging and toxic compounds. Um, also, um, Grow agricultural producers across, um, I think mostly these citations here are for wine uh, grape growers. So for um, 
bird friendly wines, they're actually um, able to uh, market those in a way that's more profitable to them. So they're more desirable to the consumer. And so being sustainable, promoting um, raptors, overusing other harmful techniques is actually becoming popular because it's also profitable. Um, this, oh, this, oops, sorry. This picture here is inside of a barn owl box. So um, they will, they're voracious predators and they will actually hunt more than they can eat. And it, it gets stashed up overnight. And um, this box had about four or five nestlings in it. So they'll, they would be snacking on these during the day, but this is way more rodents than they can eat. And they just had, they're really lucky. They had really good parents, um, but the um, research has also shown that just having barn owls uh, around is reduced, is correlated with reduced pest activity and increased yield. So we've seen that um, in alfalfa fields. Um, and then we've also seen that barn owls are able to target the most common pe prey, so, or prey or pest. Um, to us. Um, so here in the Sacramento Valley, um, we looked at barn owl diet and we saw that um, their diet changed depending on what was the most common pest species. Um, and so that's important because we um, know that they can actually help with pest outbreaks and things like that when they do occur. Um, and then just the sheer amount of food that a barn owl can eat, um, over 220 pounds of rodents. Um, another study looked at a, a camera, they placed cameras inside nest boxes to watch prey deliveries and they counted them. And they found that um, they counted um, three to 4,000 rodents uh, per nest box per breeding attempt. So barn owls can actually have two nests per year if they are an experienced pair. So we're talking about a lot of rodents here. Um, another um, research uh, project investigated how gopher activity changed when barn owls were nearby and actually showed that um, when barn owls were nesting, um, when they had an active nest, gopher activity was reduced by 14%. And so um, these, are, these are really um, great numbers and um, figures and things that we like to share with um, agricultural producers just to show like this will make a difference. This is really important. And not everybody needs to see this to want to promote raptors, but it also helps because they're going to be spending money and and um, time in um, creating and managing habitat for raptors. And so knowing that they um, have a, a benefit is is really important. Um, I really just like to share this slide because barn owls are really weird looking at all different stages of life. Um, this is about a day old barn owl, um, but they start to kind of get fluffy, fluffier. And then they, before they leave the nest in about eight weeks, they, they look almost like they're full adults. They're very clumsy, but they, they have that majestic look to them. But um, it's quite a long time to get there. It's four weeks being incubated as an egg and then eight weeks and or even more, sometimes nine to 10 ish weeks being um, fed by their parents still. And so um, the reason why I like to highlight that is because that um, leads me to the point that safe and well maintained nest boxes are really a really important part of um, attracting and maintaining raptor pop populations, especially barn owl populations. Um, we don't want to see this and we want to see these larger nest boxes that have these safety features, such as having the opening up really high so that they can't fall out, um, ventilation, and especially in the Central Valley, um, and I think everywhere should have it, but especially in the Central Valley, these sun shade panels can help um, uh, reduce temperatures in the nest boxes, and that can prevent dehydration of the nestlings during heat waves, and it can actually um, increase the amount of nestlings that can safely grow up and, and fledge in these boxes. Um, and I said fledge, that's the term for when they are finally fully grown and they leave the nest box for the first time out into the world on their own. So we call that fledging. Um, American uh, kestrels are also a species that use nest boxes that can be attracted um, by um, creating a network of um, 
a different sort of type of a different type of box. So they um, have a smaller opening, which is the main feature. They will nest in barn owl boxes, but it's important that we provide separate boxes that have the smaller opening where they're a little more protected. So if a barn owl came into the box and American kestrel was there, you know, the American kestrel is not going to stand a chance. They're going to get kicked out. Um, so having a, uh, this their own size box can really help. Um, but there, there's less research showing the pest control potential of American kestrels. But like I was saying, their diet is um, consisting of a lot of pest species. Um, and in Michigan, in cherry orchards, their breeding perfectly overlaps with um, cherry ripening. And so they were able to actually measure economic benefits from having kestrels in those orchards. And so for here, what I'm hoping to look at in the future is um, the the intersection between kestrel breeding and wine grape uh, ripening. But unfortunately, it is a little bit later in the season past kestrel breeding. And so I'm not as hopeful, but I do think that um, since kestrels target birds that might be eating wine grapes or damaging them, um, that it could be a successful strategy. So more to come on that in the future. Um, large trees, so other raptor species are gonna be um, using uh, building or stealing nests. So great horned owls actually don't build their nests. They stole this from either a red-tailed hawk or red-shouldered hawk or a raven or something else. Um, but they need these large trees as substrate for their nests and for um, roosting in the shade. And, and um, they can also uh, provide multiple benefits just by having these large trees um, in and around our farm fields. But if you don't have trees and it might take a while for trees to get large, you can also attract raptors with uh, to hunt and, um, you know, be present in and around fields with these raptor perches. They um, really like to be at the highest point on the landscape. And so um, by having a perch, it can really um, focus them in on a specific area that they might um, hang out. And the thing about perches is I, I really like to promote these because they are a lot easier to install and maintain the nest boxes. They don't need to be sturdy at all. You know, if they fall over, there's no risk in hurting a bird at all. So it's really an easy way to start um, managing for raptors. And this is in some more at a at a winery they have or at a vineyard they have these rolling hills in the background and they have perches on the tops of each of these hills and you can find red tails kestrels golden eagles and Swainson's hawks and lots of different species using these. And barn owl boxes make really great perches as well. Um, they're often out in the open, the tallest thing on the landscape. So you will see raptors um, perching on them. Sometimes you'll see them using it as a plate like this red-tailed hawk here. And um, typically if the barn owl boxes are safe with the appropriate size opening, it isn't um, a safety concern. I think most, I know that most of these boxes actually have barn owls um, nesting in them. And, and as long as these um, openings aren't uh, too large, then um, it will exclude like red tails and eagles and great horned owls from getting in there and hurting the nestlings. Okay, so the next part of uh, managing for beneficial birds on farms uh, is really um, focused around this bird here, the western bluebird. They're really um, prominent in our area and they can be easily attracted with um, nest boxes. So they are also a cavity nesting species. They were declining and um, especially here in uh, in Davis, I'm, I'm, I live in Davis, so that's why I said here. <laughs> um, they have done a really great job of creating a nest box network um, on Puda Creek, and they're also expanding that through some of the um, green belts in Davis, and they've had a lot of success in um, promoting Western bluebirds. Um, research has shown that they also um, contribute to pest control, well, insect pest control, and um, the way that we're able to look at that is through looking at their poop and 
doing a DNA forensic analysis. So by looking at the DNA that's left over, you can match that with the different insects that they consumed. And so um, in one study, they um, were shown to eat um, lots of different species, but mostly whatever was abundant was what they're eating. And so pests become pests when they become very, very abundant. And so that gives us kind of an indication that they also can assist with pest outbreaks, insect pest outbreaks. Um, in they did a similar type of study in Napa looking at bluebird diet in vineyards and found that 50% of their diet were likely um, consisted of uh, herbivorous insects, some that um, you know damage the grapevines or transmit diseases to the grapevines. Um, and then they also ate things like mosquitoes, which is another added benefit because those can also be disease vectors for us. Um, to promote birds, so this is actually an urban example, but really just want to um, kind of hit home the point that it's really landscape complexity that promotes bird diversity. So um, by having different kinds of plants and different, um, you know, resources, we're promoting uh we're promoting beneficial birds and deterring um, pest birds because, um, so for example, with monocultures, um, a, a pest is going to see a monoculture and they're going to really be able to take it. If, if that is a good resource for them, they're really going to be able to take advantage of that and, um, you know, really be pretty damaging. And, and also the other thing about monocultures is chemical inputs. Those can have negative effects on organisms and the food web in general, and also um, uh, be detrimental for a healthy functioning ecosystem. So in this picture over here, we have lots of different resources that birds can use. And, um, and over here, a pest might just, uh, a, if you just have one resource like a monoculture and, and a pest likes it, they could you know, really come in and cause some damage. Um, and so how that translates over to agriculture is through um, creating landscape complexity by, by preserving natural areas around crop fields, but also by adding things like hedgerows. So, um, so these plants that, um, you know, invite in pollinators and other beneficial insects are also going to invite in beneficial birds. And um, there's been a variety of studies actually here in the Central Valley that um, show that that these types of things don't increase the presence of pest birds. And so a lot of times people ask, well, if I do this, am I just going to be bringing in pests? But um, that isn't the case. And so um, there's been a lot of um, resources kind of dedicated to bringing back landscape complexity to our farm fields. Um, so when we don't have a lot of habitat or trees around our fields, we aren't having um, places where native cavity nesters can, um, you know, nest. So trees need to be pretty old and kind of um, decaying to, to have enough cavities or large enough cavities for birds. And we typically remove those even if they are there because they can be hazards to humans. So um, cavity nesting species really don't have a lot of options. And and often by providing nest boxes, you can be really successful in attracting those, um, especially on farms. And what's really great is that in the spring, almost all birds are gonna be feeding their young um, protein rich insects. And, and that's gonna really increase that um, insect pest control. And so this is a bluebird, bluebird um, nest here. So you can see one, two, three, four, five bluebirds that are um, just about to fledge, I think in a maybe four, four or five more days. But um, you can always tell if it's a, if you see a bird, if it's a fledgling, like it just recently left the nest is they have these little yellow kind of like marks on the sides of their mouths and because they can open their mouths really wide so that parents can kind of stick those insects in their mouth. Um, so this is a bluebird feeding their young. And so once they're kind of th that age, they will come to the edge of the uh, nest box and and then the parents will um, just feed them from there and kind of helps because they have to do a lot more foraging trips once these 
once these <laughs> their little birds are getting older. And so um, some research that we're working on now in Napa is investigating, you know, bluebird diet. So looking at what they're eating by examining the DNA in their poop, but also where are they foraging? Are they actually getting those insects from um, vineyards? And so right here, in, um, we have this little blue and white circle with a bird, bluebird in it. And um, and all of these dots, so this is where its nest is, and all of these dots are, are places that it uh, was, um, they have these little tags on them. And so places that we got little GPS locations of where they went throughout the day. And so we can see, so this is a barn here. So just kind of for scale, this is kind of like a large size barn. And um, this is a, a field right here. So you can see that they really are foraging almost exclusively in these fields. And, and um, you know, by promoting these species, we're really actually getting a benefit of insects being consumed from inside these fields. So, um, so for nest boxes, different, like I was saying with the barn owl and the kestrel, different species have different requirements. Um, and so a really good resource, like if you are interested in um, putting up nest boxes anywhere, um, is to go to this website, nestwatch.org. It's a Cornell website and they have species from all across the um, US and um, they will talk about you know, when they'll be in a specific area, where um, they'll be geographically, and kind of give you um, an idea of how to um, build nest boxes for different species. Um, and so the, um, and like I was saying, so one of the main features that different species will need is different size openings. And um, so you could see here, so kestrels and screech owls, they have about a three inch opening, but bluebirds, they have closer to uh, a one and a half inch opening. And that's really important. Um, I just wanna point that out because by having a um, one and a half inch opening, we're excluding European starlings. So that is a non-native songbird that was introduced from Europe and has is doing really well here in North America. And they're outcompeting our native songbirds um, for cavities. And they're, they're really aggressive um, and they will always win in a battle. And there's a video online of them actually battling a kestrel and you wonder, is the kestrel even going to win? Um, so they're, they're that fierce. Um, I think the kestrel did win, so that's good. But um, by having this smaller size opening, we can promote our native songbirds and not, um, you know, our non-native ones. And if you're also interested in, um, in, creating a bird-friendly landscape in and around where you live, whether it's um, rural or urban, there's, you know, birds all around us and there's all, there's tiny little um, things that you can do that can make a huge impact. So the California Native Plant Society um, will give you lots of information about native plants that'll grow in your area, how to do that in urban area, what to consider if you want to maximize wildlife or bird habitat. Um, and a lot of times, I like to add this one because a lot of times people can't, um, they like HOAs don't like these kind of yards, especially if they're in the front yard. So um, they have information about um, bypassing those sorts of things or, you know, changing those sorts of regulations in your area that could make a huge difference in your neighborhood. The Audubon um, Plants for Birds uh, page has information on, um, you know, what plants that you could use to promote uh, beneficial birds in, in your area. And then lastly, bird identification, if you are interested in, um, in upping your bird skills, I highly recommend this Merlin app. Um, it's also by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, it can give you a really good idea of what you're looking at by um, typing in specific descriptors. It'll tell you what other species it could possibly be. Um, and I think you can even record a sound and they'll suggest um, what you're hearing, which is really great. Um, but yeah, I think just grab a pair of binoculars and, and you can start by just sitting in your backyard or or you could do what I do and um, 
drive around and look for those Swainson's hawk flocks uh, in that in in the alfalfa fields. But um, I just really encourage you. I think it's a really great way to connect with what's around you. Um, it can be a really um, great hobby. And I just uh, wanted to share these resources. So uh, with that, that's what I had to share. And I'm happy to take any other questions. Well, thanks again, Brianna. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, our uh, seminar uh, next month is going to be on September 28th, and that's going to be uh, with Laura Bogar from the Department of Plant Biology at UC Davis, and she's going to be talking about uh, symbioses between trees and fungi uh, in the soil. So be sure to sign up for that one if that's something that interests you. All right. Take care, everyone.